Well, good morning, everyone. Morning, Let me just uh, reiterate. Thank you, Randy. Uh, reiterate uh, Randy's welcome to you all. And uh, uh, as a pastor and ministry leader, I do understand that uh, taking uh, a significant, well, really the day out of a schedule, especially leading up to Christmas, is a challenge. And so we're glad and grateful that you've uh, chosen to use your, uh, what is it today, Wednesday, uh, this week, uh, to be with us here. And uh, as Randy has said, our, our, our purpose in this uh, particular uh, vision for the Leadership Roundtable uh, is to bring uh, pastors and ministry leaders together so that we can reflect on the most critical things that we think are, are facing the church and get some face time to talk about them, have interaction, uh, do Q&A, and uh, see what we can uh, learn uh, from one another. And uh, we think it's urgent. We're going to do three more of these next year. We'll, we'll be sending you information about that. It'll be at the same location. Uh, and uh, we hope that this will uh, develop and become something significant, perhaps something significant that you look forward to as part of your year as a ministry leader and as a, as a pastor. Uh, today, uh, the, we sought to provoke your interest by saying that there is a crisis of leadership in the church. Uh, Randy has already outlined that for us. And so I want to, in this first session, try and identify uh, what is the precise nature of the challenge right now uh, facing, the particular challenge facing us in the West uh, as uh, the people of God. And then in the, uh, we're going to have some lunch and uh, then we'll have some questions about this session. So, um, you know, write down anything you want to ask, uh, talk about, uh, and hopefully we can do that. I want to begin by reading to you from Ephesians chapter 1. Just to remind us about something significant as we tackle this subject, and I've called it Christ or Caesar, uh, our cultural crisis. Uh, and I want to uh, read from Ephesians chapter 1, beginning at verse 16, uh, through to the end of the chapter, so that we're reminded about the Christ that we serve. I do not cease to give thanks to you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, That he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church which is his body the fullness of him who fills all in all now when you read a passage of scripture like that uh, there's so much in it about who Christ is I wonder what it makes you think about and when I read it what I think about is the calling of God's people in history We're told here emphatically that he's put everything, God has put everything under Christ's feet. His authority is above every name and every authority, not only in this age, that's in our cultural moment, in our time, but also in the one to come. And he has been given, Christ, who is head over all things, has been given as a gift to the church. He's the head of the church. So I think about the calling of God's people in history. And so some of the questions that we're going to be dealing with both today and in the months ahead are, well, what is then the uh, kingdom of God? What is the reign of Christ? What does it mean? What does the lordship of Jesus Christ look like? How are we to discern God's working in the world? What's the relationship then between faith and public morality and public policy? What's the relationship supposed to be between the church and the state? Uh, 
uh, what is the hope for the church in history? Are Christians called to engage culture and transform cultures? These are the kinds of questions that arise when I read a passage like that. And these are especially pressing and pertinent questions for the church in our age. And I'm sure this isn't something that uh, has escaped your notice. In fact, uh, today, and I want to, in a sense, start by saying that really, uh, as has been tragically the case in uh, evangelical history, it's actually falling to some non-Christian or nominal uh, critics and leaders and social critics to point up the crisis, point out the crisis facing the church and the West today. Marcello Perra, president, former president of the, Italia, the Italian Senate, recently wrote a book called Why We Should Call Ourselves Christians. And he says this, the apostasy of Christianity is exposing the entire West to the risk of a grave cultural and political crisis and perhaps even to a collapse of civilization. And uh, if you were watching the London riots last year or are paying any attention to what's going on in Europe right now, some would argue Europe is already facing a collapse of uh, civilization of sorts. This uh, challenge uh, that's coming through non-evangelical sources in theology, philosophy, politics and so forth is pointing out that there is a massive threat to us today uh, regarding religious freedom the rule of law, the survival of the family, and hence actually the survival of Christian civilization. Uh, and this, uh, essentially this growing pagan statist vision of society that's committed to a pagan ideology that's now all around us. And uh, we as pastors and Christian leaders have con continuous opportunity to speak to groups of people. And these are the critical subjects, uh, I believe, that the church must begin to develop a response to, to articulate uh, a biblical, a sound uh, reaction, build the uh, foundations, if you will, into the life of the church. The Bible says that the church, Paul says in Timothy, to Timothy, the church is pillar and support of the truth. So that we as believers have an, an absolute obligation to address these issues. And if we care about our children, and I've got three small children, and our grandchildren to come, we should be concerned whether they are going to be able to live even in a free country where they are able to practice freely their faith. Or educate their children as they see fit. Or uh, be sure that uh, some doctor is not going to euthanize their parents, euthanize you. Because those are the kind of things we're facing right now now the bible makes very clear to us because we are fallen sinful people that without a god-given vision without a god-given mission or purpose directing our lives anarchy and death is the inevitable result and we've been living off the uh the it's like a train uh going uphill right? and a, a train that's got an engine well stoked uh will go pretty fast and it will shoot up a hill but once the coal runs out and the engine dies it will continue for a short time it will slow it will stop and then it will start shooting backwards and it will pick up speed pretty fast and a lot of Christians have said what's happened to, to Canada and the West in the last 20 years speed is picking up in the wrong direction well this is because we have been we had our engines loaded with a Christian worldview and social order and that capital is gone that fuel is gone and now the train has not only stopped it's moving in the other direction now the scripture says where there is no prophetic vision the people cast off restraint or perish some translations render it but blessed is he who keeps the law proverbs 29 18 so the bible warns us very explicitly that where we have no vision, no biblical vision. The people, beginning with the church, and then in the social order, begin to cast off restraint. That's what we are seeing. The death of a culture is the end result. So if we're going to look forward with 
hope for the future. And if we're going to address the issue of our time as a Christian people, we do need to uh, recover the prophetic vision of God's word for our lives individually and as a people, as churches, and also learn from the past. Because there is nothing new under the sun. The collapse of cultures, even of Christian cultures, has happened before. And the rebuilding process has happened before, and we have much to learn from this. It's a suicidal conceit that says, all we're interested in is the last best package up from America to solve the church's problems. You know, uh, well, maybe it's seek of this, and maybe it's, uh, maybe it's this movement, that movement, and so on. And we can just, let's buy the package down there, and pragmatically that will work. And actually not realize that what we need to do is take the time actually to look at history to look at the past to look at scripture in light of that and say what is the problem there isn't a corporate solution we need to uh, go back to the heart of the issue Martin Luther the reformer Martin Luther once said no greater mischief can happen to a Christian people than to have God's word taken away from them or falsified So that they no longer have it pure and clear. God grant that we and our descendants be not witnesses of such a calamity. End quote. Well, if you look at the church, especially in Toronto, but you look at it in the GTA, how can we not argue that as Protestant descendants of Luther, we are the witnesses of this calamity? In our church, in our schools, in our courts, in our corridors of power. We have that the word has been removed. No longer underpins our thinking in any of these areas. And when we ignore this, in, uh, as a missiologist, we say in missiology that uh, uh, if we're going to, the missiologist is seeking to analyze mission, the calling of the church, mission and evangelism in the context of history in the light of scripture. And if we ignore this missiological problem that we are facing, we actually, I would go as far as to say, we have almost nothing to say to our time. Because this is the crisis that we are facing now. This is not something that we can say, well, you know, maybe 25 years years down down the track, you know, Islam might be an issue. Or this might be a problem. These are the issues that are facing people in the courts now in this country right now so commensurate with the loss of the word in the church and Randy's already pointed to this commensurate with this is social cultural decay and sometimes Christians are shocked by this but this is a completely logical connection based on what scripture says to us that as goes the church so goes the world the church is pillar and support of the truth it is salt and it is light and when the salt loses its savour It's good for nothing but to be thrown on the path to keep the weeds away. It's no longer good as a preservative. It's no longer lighting the way. And so much of the academic help offered to the church in this area refuses to see that Luther's calamity is the problem. It's the heart of the problem. Dr. Samuel Gregg has noted that these increase, increasing numbers of commentators, social and political, are realizing and are speaking about, amazingly, the need for a decisive public return to the values and ethics of what they call the Judeo Christian worldview because they are watching their cultures collapse around them. And here we are, sat on the answer. In fact, uh, Scott, I think you sent me just an email the other day about the Bulgarian. Prime Minister, I think it was, Hungarian Hungarian Prime Minister, saying, our culture's collapsing because we've lost Christianity. This is happening all over. In fact, uh, uh, Greg points out that he says, there is a surprisingly encouraging encouraging development in all this. He says, while the churches act like uh, uh, non-governmental organizations, bleating about various social justice issues, he says this, it makes it even more ironic that increasing numbers of secular European thinkers believe Europe can only reinvigorate its distinctly Christian identity through re-engaging its Judeo-Christian heritage. 
This is certainly the conclusion of one of Germany's most prominent intellectuals, Jürgen Habermas. A self-described methodological atheist, Habermas has been insisting for some time that Europe no longer has the luxury of wallowing in historical denial. As Habermas wrote in his 2006 book, A Time of Transitions, and I'm quoting now, Christianity and nothing else is the ultimate foundation of liberty, conscience, rights and democracy, the benchmarks of Western civilization. To this day we have no other options. We continue to nourish ourselves from this source. Everything else is postmodern chatter. Now that's an that's a atheistic German intellectual, one of, considered one of Germany's leading intellectuals, making essentially an appeal to Christianity. Now this is a very telling statement. It's something that eludes many evangelicals to whom it should be most obvious. So there is a kind of mushy-mindedness that has afflicted us uh, that is pervasive in my generation certainly and the younger generation but there are signs that people even in the secular world are slowly beginning to realize that this decline this banishment of Christianity from all of these areas of life especially from the what we term the public institutions is leading us to, so to social collapse and cultural death we're living through a time, in fact, that Martin Luther prayed that he would never see. Let me quote Martin Luther to you one more time. He says this, Whosoever has Christ has rightly fulfilled the law. But to take away the law altogether, which sticks in nature and is written in our hearts and born in us, is a thing impossible and against God. Whereas the law of nature is somewhat darker and speaks only of works, therefore Moses and the Holy Ghost more clearly declare and expound it, by naming those works which God would have us do and to leave undone. Hence Christ says, I am come not to destroy the law. Worldly people would willingly give him royal entertainment who could bring this to pass and make out that Moses through Christ is quite taken away. Oh then we should quickly see what kind of a life there would be in the world. But God forbid and keep us from such errors and suffer us not to live to see the same. In other words, he's saying, Lord, don't let us live to suffer to see the erosion of biblical faith and truth in our lives, in our families, in our churches, in the public sphere. What kind of a world, he says, will that produce? Now, it needs to be said that none of this means the Christian faith is a matter of social utility. So what I'm not saying, and I don't think that what the church needs to say is somehow that the Christian faith is there to give us a better life. Right? A, a better life is a byproduct, right? Because he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. Jesus says, I have come that you might have life, and life in all its fullness. John 10, verse 10. When uh, uh, some of the... Uh, Inquirers after the truth in the New Testament in conversation with Jesus said, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He says, what does the law say? Do that and you'll live. Now, you can't be saved, of course, by washing yourself in the law. But he says, this is my word is the way of life. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So it is the case that Jesus Christ is Lord, he's King, he's Saviour, he's come to establish his kingdom. But that kingdom may mean for us suffering, persecution, even death. We're not Christians because we think, well, that gives me an easier life. Right? That's going to give me a better life. Nonetheless... Because of the resurrection power of Christ that we read there in Ephesians 1. Where the omnipotent working of the Holy Spirit raises Christ from the dead. This power, this dunamis of God is now an inescapable byproduct of the ministry of the gospel. So it should be our constant expectation as ministers of the gospel that this gospel that we preach, this truth that we preach, this word that we preach is going to impact and transform individuals, families, and families will impact 
towns and communities and communities and towns impact cities and cities impact nations. The inherent power of the Almighty God resides in the believer by the person of the Holy Spirit and that means, brothers and sisters, that the new creation is already at work in the world. We shouldn't just sit and say, well, the new creation's coming. It's already come. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. And Christ is making all things new. The task that's laid before us by the power of the Holy Spirit is working in cooperation with Christ's transforming work, who is making all things new. And this happens by first regeneration where hope and life and forgiveness and joy and peace and righteousness justice restoration healing social well-being law-abiding faith characterize a christian people that's the nature of the gospel and when we turn away from this gospel of the kingdom social decay and every kind of evil proliferate and that's the inevitable consequence of a loss of the gospel now, I do want to come to the specific, that's the general picture, theologically. I want to come to the specific expression of this that we're facing in our time. The uh, church historian Francis Young said this, he says, Much popular Christianity is effectively Aryan rather than Chalcedonian. That is... That it, rather, it, that, that it is really God who is revealed and at work in Jesus is the one fundamental of the Christian tradition which Chalcedon sought to preserve. That Jesus was truly human and therefore able to relate to us and ultimately save us is the other fundamental at issue. There are two things that the Chalcedon Council, one of the early councils of the church, AD 451, made abundantly clear, was that Jesus Christ is fully God and he is fully man. In the one aspect, in his humanity, he's able to save us, relate to us. In his godhood, he is Lord, he is King. It is God who is at work and revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. We as a people uh, and as a church some, sometimes need to be reminded of that very elementary point. There are movements in the church today that really sound like Christ is an adopted human being who has lent some divinity or lent the spirit of God. He is God. And he is fully man. And this summarized Christian theology for both the Eastern and Western church. It was that the church gathered to deal with these things because they realized some of the implications. Now, the Western church remained faithfully Chalcedonian. It didn't drift into uh, Arianism and like uh, heresies. Therefore, it was not weakened by Islam. And it actually began to build Christendom throughout the West. I'm going to give you a bit of church history here. And this gave rise to the principles of liberty that you and I enjoy, enjoy today. You do know, you are aware, that most people in history have not lived in freedom. Most people have not lived in liberty. That has not been the experience of most human beings throughout most of history. It's been argued, in fact, that AD 451... The date of the Chalcedon Council is one of the most important dates in all history, establishing the Christian foundation of Western culture that made possible the development of liberty. Why is that? Well, the church historian Roland Bainton of Yale University saw Chalcedon as absolutely critical to the building of Western civilization. This is what he says. The creed of Chalcedon affirmed the full deity and full humanity of Christ in two natures. The church, which in the East did so much to disintegrate the empire, in the West became the builder of Christendom, which, however attenuated, still survives as Western civilization. Now, what happened, as you know, is that the pagan world collapsed as the gospel began to spread. Pagan education collapsed. Pagan religion collapsed. 
And the and don't forget, there was a very small group of people, 120 Christians, in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. When you actually begin to think of the whole Greco-Roman world and its power, its authority, its history, and that this small group of Jewish heretics, by the power of the Holy Spirit, began to transform the world. So much so that Paul refers to Caesar's household in Philippians at the close of that letter being invaded already by the gospel. Now, when the barbarians, many of them were Christian, by the way, uh, sacked Rome, the church stepped in to assume many of the functions that the Roman world, the Roman government, had been responsible for, and the process of education and civilizing people fell to the church. Orthodox Christianity recognized that Christ Jesus was God and King. He was fully God and fully man. He was the God man. He was the second Adam. And that in Christ Jesus, we are the new humanity. And this led to the flourishing of a free church that was able to assume godly responsibility in many social, civil, educational areas of life now I'm not going to go into a defense of the medieval church and some of the distortions of that we can pick up on some of those things in in the Q&A time if you want but uh, this these this stretch from education to being judges the, the the regalia of a Roman bishop that you see today if you've ever wondered why a bishop has the mitre and all the robes and all of that he's wearing the robes of a Roman magistrate Constantine said the only justice now in the Empire is given by you guys, so you're all going to be the judges now. Because the Christian courts were giving justice, the Roman ones weren't, they were slow, sometimes it took 30, 40 years to get a, a case into the courts. And Paul, the apostle, had commissioned the church to create courts, you know that, don't you? Why do you go to law against your brother? You preached on that passage? <clears throat> Are there not men amongst you? Who are able to judge in these matters. Be better that you be defrauded. Than you go to law before the unbeliever. We have an article on that by uh, Ruth Ross. In our current edition of of Jubilee. On when can Christians sue and so on. But the church created Christian courts. Christian education and so on. I could digress there. I mustn't. That's not in my notes. But in what way. Did this verdict of Chalcedon help create the vision for freedom and the reign of God? Well, first we have to understand something about paganism. Pagan philosophy was statist. That is, it saw the ultimate order, the most important institution in the world, as the state. That's how paganism saw reality. It substituted God It was where divinity was located. If there was divinity, it was found in the kings and pharaohs and emperors. That's where the locus of divinity was identified, in the state. And this goes all the way back to Babylon, Egypt, Persia and the Greco-Roman world. They, They worshipped their leaders of state as gods. The pharaohs were considered sons of the sun god this is why many people when they read the book of Exodus don't really understand what's going on in the confrontation between Moses and Pharaoh it's a confrontation between two gods in the Old Testament we encounter Moloch worship Uh, 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 the name Malcolm actually derives from Moloch, uh, uh, Moloch king it was statism It was the worship of kings as gods. And the differences in this worldview between gods and people were in degree, not in kind. So you could become a god. You could uh, be elevated to the status of a god. This is what was believed about the Roman Imperium itself. That's what the emperor cult was about. The emperor was a god. And the wars of Rome were the wars between gods. The gods that were worshipped by the Romans who were deified men and the gods that were worshipped by these other 
uh, nations and they carried off their gods. So Rome took all these gods in as conquered gods. This is something that Augustine points out in the City of God. When the Christians were being blamed for the fall of Rome, he says, your gods were already defeated. The gods you worship, they were defeated gods anyway. So self-deification meant salvation in the pagan worldview. You weren't saved by grace. You were saved by realizing godhood. This is actually true even of uh, Eastern religion, of course, today as well. People could graduate to the status of gods, especially kings, heads of state, monarchs. And so it was inevitable for non-Christian philosophy to see the state. If you think about the state as a big man, man enlarged, right? Representing man, okay? Statism. It was natural for pagans to see that as the central point of history manifesting divinity in the body politic in their offices. And this was the faith of all paganism. So the church, when it was born, had this other claim. The claim of Ephesians 1. How do you preach Ephesians 1 into a world that says... Men graduate to being gods. Divinity is found in the state. The emperor is a god. You have to worship him. When the uh, early Christians preached the gospel, the Romans didn't care about Christian theology. It was a political sin if you do not offer incense to the, to the emperor. So this came to vivid expression in the first century when the Roman emperor, Augustus Caesar, declared himself to be the saviour of the world. This is what he said. He issued a government declaration. The words may sound familiar to you. Salvation is to be found in none other save Augustus. And there is no other name given to men in which they can be saved. Now, I hope that this reminds you of St. Peter's rebuttal in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, this wasn't just a declaration that Jesus saves me from my personally from my sins, which he does. It was a resistance to a particular view of the state as Lord and Sovereign over life and this is why there was this intractable hostility and there could be no peace between Christianity and pagan Rome one would win the day the Christians were tossed into the arena as you know and martyred the specific conflict then which confronted the early church and the claims of the state is just as real in our own time so In an article reflecting on the alleged failures of the government to prevent the attacks of September 11th in 2001, the Harvard professor and former leader of the Liberal Party, Michael Ignatieff, ominously articulates the modern concept of sovereignty. This is what he says. I'm quoting Michael Ignatieff. A sovereign, a sovereign is a state with a monopoly on the means of force. It is the object of ultimate allegiance and the source of law, end quote. Now, we have to take in the force of that statement if we're going to understand the challenge of our time. The source of sovereignty, the source of law, the object of ultimate allegiance. That's the modern view of the state today. It's a pagan view of the state. And there is no difference between that idea and the one held by Rome. Neither is it any different to the one facing the church in China today. The church in China, the unofficial church in China, is facing a state which actually shares Ignatius' view. One BBC commentator uh, grasped the issue of China well in an article. I want to uh, quote it to you. He says, after the communist victory in 1948, missionaries were expelled. But Christianity was permitted in state-sanctioned churches so long as their primary allegiance 
as long as they gave primary allegiance to the Communist Party. Mao, on the other hand, described religion as poison, and the Cultural Revolution of the 1960s and 70s attempted to eradicate it. Driven underground, Christianity not only survived with its own Chinese martyrs, it grew in strength. This is not written by a Christian. This is the BBC, which is the British Broadcasting Communism Organisation. <laughs> and since the 1980s, when religious belief was again permitted, the official churches have gradually created more space for themselves. They report to the State Administration for Religious Affairs. They are forbidden to take part in any religious activity outside their places of worship. That's what Randy was talking about earlier. And you know there's a move on in the States right now to change the, the freedom of religion to freedom of worship. To restrict the Christian faith to places of worship effectively. They had to sign up to the slogan, love the country, love your religion. In return, the party promotes atheism in schools, sound familiar, but undertakes to protect and respect religion until such a time as religion itself will disappear. What the authorities consider non-negotiable is the house church's refusal to acknowledge any official authority over their organisation. Now, if you look at the history of the church in Canada... We used to enjoy such a freedom. Your church isn't taxed. You don't pay property taxes. Do you know why not? Because it's God's embassy. You can't tax a foreign embassy. Right? It's sovereign soil. That's the idea of an embassy. The church was seen as God's embassy. You can't tax the embassy of God. The church enjoyed freedom. Already we really exist at the licensing of the CRA already and uh, there is talk of course of you may be worried about your clergy tax deduction and uh, you should be and uh, whether already now in the cities where churches are being built they're asking the code the, the regulations are saying how much of this space do you worship in have you come across this yet I have because I, when I was looking for property and they will uh, only make tax exempt the bit that you literally sing and preaching the rest or oh, well that's that's taxable taxation is a claim to ownership i'm not going to digress onto that either despite this opposition though with the principle of freedom from scripture the chinese christian community continues to grow worshiping christ as king of kings and lord of lords christ not the state as the ultimate source of allegiance of sovereignty and of law. Did you know that today in China there are more people worshipping Christ on a Sunday morning than there, are in, than there is in all of Europe put together? That's over 60 million people. And we are forced to ask the same question. The issue in the first century was one of lordship and sovereignty. We have got the same question facing us today. It's come right back to roost because paganism is back. Whose right is it to rule? That's the question. Is Christ the object of primary allegiance or is man, that is the state, the man enlarged? Does the state's authority supersede that of God the Son? Now, the Council of Chalcedon, AD 451, when they met together, what they were doing is they were trying to clarify a point of Christology, pastoral in character primarily, that had this tremendous bearing on the future of the Western world. Our creeds define us. You know, my parents lived and worked in the Islamic world for 15 years. And uh, to become a Muslim, you just have to recite the creed. And you're a Muslim. And if you go to an Islamic land, you see Islamic culture. Because culture is the public manifestation of religion. So our creeds define us. They define the social order. Now define whether your children and your grandchildren have freedom in the future. They met first upholding this orthodox understanding of Christ's full humanity and full deity, but they clarified it. What they said was that this union 
of God and man in the person of Jesus Christ was two natures without confusion. Right? Man did not become a God in this. There was no confusion. It was without change, without division, and without separation. So, that's, that was the Chalcedon formulation. They didn't create two persons. They preserved the unity of Christ's person, which brought together these two natures in unconfused union. Now, that unconfused union is very, very important because the indirect of this formulation was that Christianity could never be melded with paganism in any form because the natural here does not ascend to the divine or the supernatural. The only way to join the divine, divine authority, sovereignty, the only possible joining of divinity and humanity was in the incarnation of Jesus Christ and by God's revelation to man. The bridge is golfed only by revelation and by the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Salvation, therefore, Chalcedon said, cannot be by politics. You cannot be saved by politics. But that was actually the, the belief of the uh, ancient world. And it's now the belief of the modern world. So Chalcedon barred human institutions from professing to be incarnations of deity able to unite the two worlds in their existence. This is the critically important point. So if the state, not just the state, actually any other institution, could not be conceived as an imminent divine human order. And the reason that this created liberty was that in such a case, where, where a human institution can arrogate to itself sovereignty and the right to define law and life and marriage and the family and gender and so on, where they actually collapse the human and the divine, there is no appeal beyond the state. There is nowhere to go for us to say, that's tyranny. That's evil. That's wrong. The final order is man's order. And man becomes a political animal. And that's what the Greek philosophers held. Who needed to be ruled by an oligarchy. The philosopher kings. An intellectual elite who would tell you what's good for you. Who would define your life and your existence. Liberty was non-existent here. Now, the state could say, we give you permission to do so and so, as long as you recognize this ultimate allegiance first. We'll give you a limited area of permission here. But there was no liberty apart from and beyond the state where one could say, my liberty and freedom is grounded in God as a creature made in his image. In terms of God's definition of reality and truth and meaning. Life and law, without an appeal to God, where these two things are collapsed, where the human and the divine are collapsed, means that the governance of all society is simply reduced to an aspect of social policy. Law is social policy. Truth is social policy. Life is social policy. Gender is social policy. Everything is just an aspect of this collapsed source of power, sovereignty, and allegiance. So for Chalcedon, for the Chalcedon Council, Jesus was not a divinized man. He wasn't an ordinary guy, an ordinary Joe, as it were, who gets lent divinity or ascends to divinity. Now I have to tell you that these ideas are coming back into the church. They've been in the liberal churches for a very long time, but they're creeping into evangelicalism. You know, uh, you read statements like, God was in Jesus in a very unique way. Brian McLaren, generous orthodoxy. What does that mean? The Hindus believe that. We have to understand that Chalcedon was saying people and institutions are not divinized either through Christ. And this meant that 
Even the Eastern patriarchs claim to being an incarnation of the divine presiding over a visible kingdom on earth. Some of the church's claims to being the God's only order through the Eastern patriarch were also denied. Rather, what happens is that by revelation and incarnation, the man Jesus Christ is made our sanctification and our redemption and we participate in his humanity. We participate in his new humanity. He's the second Adam, but we don't participate in his divine essence. When you became a Christian, you didn't become a God, did you? And I know the word says we are God, small g, in the sense that we're sons of God, but you didn't become divine. You're still human. This closed the door then on statism, as well as some overblown claims that the church began to make later on. Instead, all power and authority belongs to God, and God's reign isn't mediated by man's institutions in the sense that uh, they uh, define God and God's order for men. Jesus Christ alone had all authority and power, and everything must serve him as his diaconate, as his ministers, even the state, Romans 13, beginning in verse 1. So Jesus declared that in him, he said, is true freedom. If the Son sets you free, and don't forget he spoke these words into a world, a world and a context rife with slavery, chattel service. If the Son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. Free men and women, no longer slaves to sin, or even the sinful structures of men used to lord it over one another, we can make a direct appeal to God, to a transcendent authority beyond the state that makes true freedom possible. That's why the West became free. Because there was an appeal beyond the state itself, to man enlarged, to God, to a transcendent Authority. Now you say, well, that's interesting, Joe, the ancient world, brilliant. Surely it's not that simple now. Well, actually, it's just as clear. Because the re-emergence of statism really could be traced back maybe a bit further, but certainly with the French Revolution, you had the idea of the social contract for society. And we had also, in, during the... Uh, enlightenment so called and don't forget the humanists give these periods of history their names so Christian era is the dark ages and then when humanism is revived it's the enlightenment so suddenly everybody's enlightened again the Hegelian politics of power came into play which simply stated meant the Hegel put it very plainly the state is the divine idea as it exists on earth He's basically for him the it's complicated, but he was a sort of pantheist, and he believed that uh, the world spirit was realizing itself, uh, uh, moving towards a point of unity, if you will, through man and his reason, particularly manifest in the state, and this has influenced and informed our understanding of ourselves since the so-called enlightenment. And so the problem that we face today as Christians is that there are two concepts that we're given in our culture and through our education. And it's that freedom has essentially now been defined politically rather than theologically. So you've probably, I would guess, never had a theological discussion like this of the nature of freedom. You probably heard political statements about freedom, about democracy and so on. But <clears throat> does democracy really make all men free? Democracy, vox populi, vox dei, the voice of the people is the voice of God. Is that a Christian idea? Now, we can believe in representative government, but the voice of people, that means that the tyranny of the mob, the, the tyranny of the 51%, does that define truth? If we took a, you know, a, a vote in here, and let's say it was a mixed crowd, and we took a vote on the divinity of Christ, and... 30 of you said he wasn't and 15 of you said he, he was does that mean Christ is not divine <laughs> democracy itself doesn't provide freedom so we have these political conceptions 
of freedom, but they've not been defined theologically. And the challenge of non-Christian thought has been, it's got these two ideas. One of nature, we're told that there is nature. By that they mean there's this deterministic given world out there, this unity, nature. And on the other hand, there's supposed to be freedom. But how can you bring together a deterministic world of nature, an evolutionary world of nature, and still retain freedom? Because the philosophers say now we're really basically determined. You're a product of your genes. The moral component is taken out of much reasoning today. Uh, the correctional system is therapeutic. It's therapy. It's not the issues of sin and restitution. People are sick. Because they need to be readjusted to fit better into our social order. So the, tr the attempt to unite these two opposing ideas of determinism and nature as a unity and, and uh, freedom or responsibility and diversity, they're unable to do it. The two concepts that have dominated in the end politically have been anarchy, where you've got no law, so you've got total freedom. And on the other hand, tyranny, which is the idea of that deterministic order. There's no, there's no freedom for any area. How did they? How have we sought to get around this? Well, you can have the state trying to regulate everything, controlling everything to avoid anarchy. Uh, to avoid the atomism, though, the anarchic individual in the natural order of things, the Enlightenment said we need, a, we need some kind of social contract. So we just need an agreement. And this is what people largely believe today. You, you just need social consensus on something. And if we gain some sort of social consensus, while well, the people want this, the people say that. Then you think you've built some kind of order out of the chaos. What they were worried about, though, is that if it's just... Uh, if we're trying to um, retain values that go beyond our own minds, uh, uh, if you to retain spiritual values, moral values, how can you do that without God? Well, they said, well, the, the, the creative power of the mind, of man's imagination, is going to have to furnish us with these. And so what has tended to happen is that we have... As we've banished God's word into irrelevance, we've had these two ideas in our culture. Those who want absolute freedom, and there's an anarchistic motif. And on the other hand, there's those who say, well, to deal with the chaos, we need more regulation. Because God's law and, and his word are no longer regulating people's lives. So we've got this social contract in place. And we need to, because people are becoming more and more this or more and more that, we need to regulate and control in order to avoid the collapse of our society. Did all of our regulations prevent the economic meltdown? And that's a religious issue. It's an issue of integrity because credit presupposes trust. And trust presupposes responsibility. Do you trust somebody who's irresponsible? But if we live in an irresponsible age that's lost the word of God, you can't have credit. That's what we discovered. Now our economies have collapsed. And now we've got the fiscal cliff. These things are all interrelated when God's word is jettisoned. So when we actually understand Christ as fully God, fully man, I'm almost done, we begin to understand the significance of the Christian claim that the reign of God, the sovereignty of God, the salvation of God, the word of God is the source of human liberty and every other alternative is tyranny and slavery. Because what we find is when we abolish God and his word, we don't get utopia, we get slavery. Man can't live with anarchy. He can't live with the idea of total freedom because all you've got is chaos. So he says, out of the chaos, let's have a social contract. But then if man is not, doesn't see himself as a sinner and accountable to God, that unity is impossible to preserve. So the state has to step up and say, we will make sure that we control and govern and regulate everything. Define everything. The Christian's life and self-realization, though, is not comprehended by the state. It's in God. 
If the reign of God then is the essence of the biblical vision, then the kingdom of God in scripture is the plan of God and his goal for history. God is king. Christ is king. This is how he's presented to us. He sits down at the right hand of God, ruling and reigning, fully man, fully God. The only connecting point between heaven and earth, true sovereignty and power and man. The only one who's able to be the source of authority and source of liberty. Then if God's reign is the biblical vision, then the kingdom of God, of course, is his blueprint for history. Now, a king or a sovereign must have a realm. You ever heard of a king without a kingdom? Or a sovereign without a realm? Or without a scepter? Or without a law? No. It's impossible. So <clears throat> we have to ask ourselves as Christians today, if Christ is king, what's he king of? Now we can say, well, he's king of heaven. But actually that's not biblical. For a start, heaven comes out of the, the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven into the earth and we're taught to pray thy kingdom come thy will be done where? on earth as it is in heaven so we can't simply say well he's king of heaven because the bible doesn't say that he says he's lord over this age Jesus begins the great commission as we've called it by saying all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me all authority in heaven and earth, he says, is mine. So he has, he must have a scepter and a law and a realm. And the Bible says this is cosmic in scope. And the opposition to this, the satanic strategy against the kingdom of God, has always been man's self-deification. So if you go back to the very first instance of it, where do you find it? In Genesis chapter 3. What was the temptation of our, to our first parents? You shall be as gods. Doing what? Determining, defining for yourself. Good and evil. Right from wrong. Truth from falsehood. You can usurp the prerogatives of sovereignty. Has God really said? No. You won't die. I've got a better plan. And we see that then expressed in the Tower of Babel, you'll recall. This was the dream of Babel. And the dream of Babel has repeated itself throughout history. To build a kingdom, when it says reaches to the heavens, it didn't mean it was an ancient skyscraper. It meant that they believed that it was a kind of astrological idea. And that, that somehow the demonic powers uh, governed fate, governed destiny. We're increasingly seeing that, of course, today as well. Very explicit pagan expressions. But when you ask yourself, and you look at the political structures of today, the internationalism, the UN, and what their objectives are, a world currency, world bank, international law, world government, and so on and so forth, the British politicians quite freely and openly speak of the new world order, where man defines all things. And guess who's on the outside? Right? It's the Christians. Why? Because we say, no, there's only one connection point between heaven and earth. There's only one source of ultimate sovereignty and all kings and realms must serve Jesus Christ. And isn't that the nature of the Great Commission? Or were you told, go into bits of the world and tell people they can buy fire insurance from you? Is that the gospel? No. Go into all the world with the gospel and disciple, teach, actually in the Greek, discipline the nations. The nations. It's a slightly different order when we think about it like that. The most fertile expression then of this collective effort to rebel against God's order has been this dream, man's statism. And so if we're going to pursue... The kingdom of God, the reign of God, the lordship of Jesus Christ over all things. We have to begin by asserting Christ as saviour and as lord. And you know the confession of the early church, the first Christians, was quite simple for baptism. Jesus Christ is lord. 
because that could get you killed. They didn't actually need to share a testament, you know, I was on the Alpha course and, you know, Alpha saved me. You know, just kidding. Um, I did Alpha in London. It's a good course. Most of it. Let's not go there. Um, yeah, that's good. Mostly it's a good tool. They said Jesus Christ is not an addition to my life like a gym membership. He doesn't solve the spirituality gap of my Christian experience. Great house, great family, great car, still feel empty, add Jesus. They said Jesus Christ is Lord. No other union of the human and divine is possible. There is no agency, institution or state that can claim or usurp for itself the prerogatives of God. There is no other ultimate sovereign acceptable. There is no other law that's submissible to command our obedience. Where man's law commands what God forbids, allegiance to Christ is a Christian duty. Christ alone, in his word and by his spirit, speaks the word of life and salvation, not the state. And wherever the state tries to speak that word of salvation, so I would say we have today a belief in what we can call a messianic state. The saving state. Where it says, well, we will speak the word. That's the usurpation of sovereignty. We, will, we, will, uh, the, the, we transfer the great doctrines of scripture either to the individual or to the state if we deny them to God. So we take the concept of sovereignty, we take it from Christ, we give it to the state. We take the doctrine of providence, providence, and we give it to the state. We take the doctrine of incarnation, which is what we've been talking about here, we give it to the state. You incarnate divinity and sovereignty. And we even have doctrines of, of judgment, environmental catastrophe, and hell for all those who disobey. You have a complete system in which we transfer the prerogatives of God to man. And the most popular form of that today is not the anarchistic motif. It's statism. And during the rest of today, we're going to talk about that, uh, hear, from some, hear about some of the specific applications of that, and uh, talk about what the church's role is in responding to it. Thank you.